Hello, everyone. Good morning from Berlin. Uh, my name is Kalam. I'm here moderating a panel with, uh, with uh, artists and businesses working at the intersection of AI, music, and technology. The title of this panel is Artificial Intelligent Musicians, Friend or Foe. And um, I'm hoping over the next 30 minutes to 45 minutes to, to give you a, a good overview of where the cutting edge in terms of uh, expression, creative expression and technology use cases are in, in AI right now in the music space. Um, joining me on this panel um, is uh, Reaps 100, Harry F, artist. Uh, Rainier Kim also go goes by the artist's name, Quartet XO. Heiko Hoffman from Beatport and Marcus Schwarzer from Cyanite.ai, which is a, a startup here in Berlin. Um, so I think to just give you a little preamble in terms of uh, what, what, we're, what we're going to discuss and what topics are, are surfacing today, as, um, as, as many of, of, you, of the audience will, will know, there's, there's a lot of hype around AI at the moment. And, and this stems from, from two sides, I feel. There's, there's, on the one side, we have popular apps that we use on a regular basis, whether it's the social networks, whether it's our music apps, whether it's Netflix, or even in work with the, the tools we use, whether it's Microsoft Teams or Google Docs. And, and when we search for information online, we use search engines that use a lot of AI to create these incredibly customized and relevant experiences for us. And uh, so for many people, it's, it's somewhat seamless to just jump in and, and have something that is tailored towards you. And these apps have, have spent and invested into R&D around creating this over a number of years and, and, um, and they have scaled to millions of users globally. On the other extreme, in our day-to-day -day lives, we experience uh, a very negative effect with, uh, with new technologies such as synthetic media and, and Twitter bots in the way they can sway popular opinion. And, and in some cases, uh, you could argue they, they sway election results. In the, back, in the backdrop to this, we also see in the media terms such as machine learning, uh, user data, use snooping, uh, our phone snooping on us through, through the chat apps, uh, term, acronyms like RNNs, GANs, and uh, conversational AIs. So there's one called GPT-3, uh, getting into the headlines. This is fantastic for media outlets because it can use this to attract attention, especially if you have uh, uh, GPT-3, for example, can essentially write a whole story for you based on a few lines of text. It can also start a conversation with you. And, and looking at these things, it, it's, it, for some people, it spooks them. For others, it's, it's, a, an amazing, it's amazing to see what you can do with the tech. Much of this tech is trained on data that is collected for, through uh, online forums or, or directly from people who participate in, in the data acquisition. And this stirs a lot of debates around the ethics uh, in terms of how these technologies are developed, whether they are biased, uh, what bias means if it's trained on, on, on specific types of data, how do we open up to, to broader, broader data sets. And, also, and quite importantly, I think today as well, as we have um, open technologies, open source becoming the norm, the questions of ownership in terms of the structures of these technologies as we open them up to the world. Um, today we've got bi businesses and artists on the panel. I think in, from a business perspective, I, I used to be in a, a company that worked, uh, that creates hardware and software for music technologists and mu for mu music, for, for music, it's a music tech company. And, um, and what I found in there is that when we think about designing um, uh, experiences using new technology, it's always ends up um, going the direction of what's beneficial in terms of delivering the, a company's KPIs and, and, hit it, and helping a company hit, hit its revenue, revenue targets or open up new revenue streams. Sometimes uh, this means that the companies go out, sometimes companies are able to go outside of that and develop new interactions and new business opportunities using new tech. And they can target new use cases from that. Much of the innovation for this comes from activities such as corporate labs, accelerators, 
R and D or marketing collaborations with creatives that that uh, attract new audiences and help help the companies themselves think about how, what these new use cases could be and develop them. However, I think there's there's an interesting role artists can play uh, from a from a very different direction that is less uh, deterministic as opposed to a company. Uh, what I see around is, is the technology getting more sophisticated. And as it gets more sophisticated, the, the terms we use to describe it, whether it's RNNs, GANs, blockchains, peer-to-peer uh, -peer protocols, all this stuff is, are words that mean nothing to a lot of people. They're just words that they use to, to, uh, to ca as a catch-all for, for what's happening in, in terms of what they read and what they want to communicate to others. Working with Rainia and Harry uh, over the last year, and uh, also working with startups in this space over a few years, I feel like there's an interesting opportunity right now for artists to open up the um, tech such as AI to a broader audience. They, they bring a pl pl plurality of viewpoints uh, and use tech in a, a very non-deterministic way. It's like a creative palette, see what it can do, see what you can use it for. And, and through that process, uh, I had the privilege of, of participating in it on a few occasions you get to know the, the tech in a, in a much more intimate way. You, and you also know its limitations. You're able to express that to, to other people with, with the language of the artist, such as calling the tech primitive or saying it's, it's basically a great way to sample audio. Uh, I think these sort of things are very tangible for people when they hear the output of an experiment. Uh, we will dive into this a bit more during this, this, this panel. Um, and I would like to kick off by first opening up to everyone here to give a short intro of who they are, what they're doing. Um, if we can keep it to about a minute or two, that'd be fantastic. Uh, maybe I'll start with uh, Marcus. Sure, happy to. Hi, um, I'm Marcus. Um, I'm, it's really great to be here, like a couple of familiar faces. I'm happy to be part of it. Uh, I'm the CEO of Cyanide. Um, and at Sinai, what really drives us is that we believe that uh, high tech shouldn't be exclusive to big, big tech companies. Um, we feel there was a big shift in power leaning towards big tech um, in the past 15, 20 years because they were able to continuously create great user experiences. So what we're doing is we're creating, also creating high tech, but passing over the torch to independent music companies um, to also create these experiences, to grasp on the opportunities arising from technological advances. Um, our first product is a suit of algorithms that can actually detect music. So you can throw in any sort of song and it will tell you immediately which genre it is, which mood it is, um, but also musicology factors like BPM key instruments, voice, etc. cetera. Um, we then apply catalog analytics and catalog management systems on that. So you can actually like have insights into your catalog. Hey, um, this is the stuff that we have in. So we really transform in music and artistic product into, into business intelligence data um, for people to really use. So, um, and also we, we create uh, recommendation algorithms. Um, we're still pretty early stage, about two years old. Um, and, uh, but we do have uh, really great range of first customers. Uh, amongst them is the, the SVR, which is the Southwest German Broadcasting Company. Um, and they're creating, like utilizing our recommendation algorithms to creating new experiences in radio. Um, so we're actually making them fit to compete with Spotify. So it's an incumbent player that's now competing with like uh, the new kid on the block or the not so new kid on the block anymore. Um, so we're sort of protecting like, the incumbent music uh, industry in Germany against that. Um, but also one of our customers is RTL, which is, uh, I would say, amongst the biggest media companies worldwide. Um, and they're utilizing our AI to um, always give editors and filmmakers the perfect sound to whatever film scene. So you can see it's a, it's a big range of applications that is possible with this. Um, and we're sort of like trying to tap into, into various ones. Um, yeah, these we, are all yeah. huge, huge opportunities for, for uh, media exactly. creators to, to place music in, in, the, in the formats they're working with, whether it's movies or, or, or playlists as well. Uh, thank okay. you, Marcus. Heiko Beatport, could you give us a quick intro? 
Yes, hello. My name is Heiko Hoffmann, and I'm the VP of Artist and Industry Relations at Beatport. Beatport is the main platform for DJs where they uh, discover and buy new music um, that they need and want to play with for their DJ sets. And in the past, I've been for many years editor-in-chief of uh, Groove Magazine in Germany, a magazine specialized on electronic music. And I'm um, also teaching at a music history course at NYU at the Clive Davis Institute and um, a curator for photography and, and art as well. And at Beatport, we are actually interested in exactly the same services that Marcus's company is offering and are looking at different possibilities to integrate AI into both sorting music, discovering music, and recommending music, but also interested in uh, creative ways how artists are using AI. And that's on both sides, um, on the producers who make music and are using an AI, but maybe also in the future in ways that DJs use AI or algorithms to help them with their DJ sets or how they're DJing. So um, that's my interest in the subject. Yeah, Beatport is quite unique in that it's it's uh, it's content creators for 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 samples and 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 music for for uh, content for music production are are the the are the same people who use it. So they customers also they creators in some cases. Very very interesting company, uh, very interesting history. Um, Harry, could you give us a quick intro? My name is Harry Yef. Uh, I'm also known as Reach One, Reach One Hundred. Uh, I'm part of the Experiments in Art and Technology program at Bell Labs. Uh, I'm also a culture leader with the World Economic Forum. But I came from music. Um, I've done a number of uh, music and technology spectacles and installations. Had over a hundred million views for the content that I've made. Um, but I'm specifically interested in the human experience when it comes to new technologies. I believe that there is a huge issue with the general perception of bleeding edge tech and innovation. I think many people believe it not to be accessible. And I think AI systems, smart systems are there to be a guiding light, a torch in guiding what we can actually do, how we see the world, how we see ourselves. And I believe it to be the role of artists to effectively bridge the gap between what's actually out there, what it actually does, and how people can sort of really have ownership over it. Mm. And just not let sort of sensationalism or science fiction tropes just take hold and stop people engaging. So art is responsible for bridging that gap. And it's my job as an artist and a creative director to write those spectacles, pieces of art, installations, that make sure it connects and people are ready for where the world is going. So um, purposeful um, creative direction is, is the aim. Fantastic. Thank you, Harry. Rainia? Hi, I'm Rainia Kim. Um, I go by Artisan and Culture XO. Uh, my musical journey started off with classical piano and very quickly at an early age, I didn't want to go down that route. And um, eventually I became really interested in electronic music production after living in London for so many years. And um, London, the London music scene and a lot of my favorite artists were from the side of the world. And um, that really propelled me into this new rabbit hole of just getting really immersed and kind of obsessed with music technology. And naturally that kind of took me towards this path of AI and music. And I'm mainly interested in how creative can we get with all this inspiring and emerging technology? Um, and also with like AR, VR, and XR. And as I started to actually play with these materials and work with developers and visual artists, I've just been constantly like inspired to create narratives in a way that people can understand what this technology actually does and what it means. Um, and I guess with AI, my main focus um, during the Factory Berlin Sonar Philosophy residency has been to make the intangible tangible because everyone I talk to, it doesn't matter what industry they're from, when we talk about data and AI, it's like this, you know, the cloud. <laughs> and like, we don't have any perception of how much data we consume and everything's just kind of like invisible. and. Um, some people don't even understand like their servers, like actual physical servers that hold all this information. And so um, my goal with this album was to create a very tangible experience where it's um, an actual co-creation. And that was my goal. And I think that's 
what my goal will always be. I, I often get asked of if I feel like AI will ever take over creativity and take over jobs and um, no, <laughs> my quick answer is no. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of gray areas in the middle and I think like these, um, there's a lot of potential for creating really interesting hybrid models where mm. AI, um, I mean, technology to me has always been a creative problem solving tool um, or a set of tools. And it's always been like that from learning how to teach myself how to produce my own music, um, helped me to like create an, a, this vision that I've always wanted to pull out. And um, AI is just the next frontier of technology and that's where I think it makes sense that um, more musicians and artists move that direction mm. um, and I see a lot of value also in um, more creatives moving in the space because a lot of people who work in AI who don't come from a creative background they're also in this desperate need to make the intangible tangible <laughs> you know um, and the simplest thing of like creating charts so people can understand what data is actually doing. But once you get like artists and creatives involved, you can actually create these very immersive and meaningful pieces of art that also is very emotionally touching mm. because there's, a, there's an artistic story behind it. Mm. Um, so yeah, that's me in short. Very cool. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks everyone for the intros. Um, I think we'll just go with that topic of co-creation with AI. Uh, Harry, Rainier, you've both worked with databots and other creative technologists on um, both AI and immersive experiences. I would I think it'd be great for the audience of this panel to hear a bit more about so, some of your more recent, recent work in this area, maybe even focusing on the AI aspect of, of working with uh, sample RNN with, with databots. Or, or any other examples you think are relevant. If you could give a couple of minutes to that, that'd be great. Um, sure. um, Harry, you want to go first? Yeah, yeah. It's, um, I think the most important thing to kind of take from that type of process is just the underpinning principles of like why artists should embrace this type of process because many of the creative industries, many sort of uh, creatives do have what I mentioned before, some kind of pushback. Um, but I actually came from tournament chess growing up and having uh, my first relationship with uh, an AI chess opponent was actually a very beautiful connection. I grew up in quite a rough area in London. And when I was during my summer holidays where I didn't have anyone to play, I couldn't afford to go to like um, certain like spots to have games. My dad got me a, a chess AI and that, uh, that, com that system uh, really improved my game. So I always had a fondness of AI and realized that there was actually something quite sort of amazing there. And when I started to have access to certain like, AI systems, as someone who is a vocalist and someone who pushes their voice the way that I do, I was very interested in, okay, so can I, in the same way I had an AI system that helped me improve in chess, can I have an AI system that presents original ideas or augmented ideas um, in performance. So teaming up with DataBots, um, I discovered this sort of running principle, this consistent theme in all my work up until the projects to this day, which is uh, something I call intelligent interruption. So that performance with CJ was about uh, creating a dialogue with uh, a, a neural net, uh, creating a composition creating large data sets of my voice. And everybody's kind of heard this idea of uh, using an AI system to present something new, but it's about what you take from that. And I think this is the most important thing is these systems offer a guiding light, insights into your expertise that you can't really achieve any other way. So for me spending over 10,000 hours composing and writing with my voice, I was able to be interrupted in a way that presented original new ideas. So that project was a composition for Bell Labs. Um, and over the last three months, I've been using a different system to basically take data sets of different musicians and I can now uh, collaborate with them in real time uh, using a mosaic system. So effectively I can have a James Blake vocal, I could have an Apex Twin composition and I could be like, <laughs> and I'll have a reply 
effect, which is made from pieces of that composition. And these systems in themselves are great, but they are not autonomous. Me as an artist, me as a creative director, it's allowing for inventiveness. It's allowing for a new insight and interactivity that I can't achieve in any other way. And something that's very interesting is over the pandemic, this real time system that I've been working with was the only way that I could have live music uh, sort of jamming interaction. So a lot of these systems that I saw as uh, future facing and progressive now have some implications for being used to survive when it comes to like actually what we need. And technology needs a little bit in terms of the general public perception needs to be seen as a, something that can facilitate our survival, facilitate our needs, not just yeah. be constantly building on a self-fulfilling hierarchy of like, this is the new thing just because it's yeah. more of a socially sort of desired uh, like tool or object. So I really, really believe that these systems are there to enhance and augment with. And yeah. I, I believe I have a, an augmented intelligence with these tools, not an artificial intelligence. Mm. Yeah, that's really great. I think for, for the audience, you, you can you can Google uh, Reaps One and and Bell Labs to check out the the, the collaboration with Databot set. And it shows Harry going into a, a famous, uh, what do you call the chamber? I can't remember now. The anechoic chamber. <laughs> the anechoic chamber. And it shows this interaction with the a visual representation of the AI where where you would spit something out and then it would spit something back and the and the 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 music, uh, sorry, the 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 actual performance evolves with that. And and I've seen you live and I've seen how how the actual interaction with such such tools with the AI, as we call it in this case, has, has also influenced your style and, and created new styles. And when you speak to the augmentation of creativity, I really like that. I think that's a really tangible uh, experience to see how you can go from from um, your previous style to something approaching 200 BPM beatboxing. Exactly. Yeah. I think that's it. just two really important points. That Anacote Chamber was actually one of the, um, it was one of the first ever built and it was called The Room Where Sounds Go To Die, which I mm. thought was such, a, such a, uh, an interesting thing. And the second thing is a system should be defined by its outcome, not what we think of it. Mm. And, and that's the, the reason that's so, so important is that this system that I've been working with has 100% influenced my style, my ability as a composer, as a writer, in a way that I wholeheartedly believe in and have ownership over. Hmm. So that's what I want to focus on when it comes to, and other artists should think about when it comes to these systems, is don't kind of slip into the self-fulfilling aspect of it. Really think about the contributions to your style, your contributions to your intention and I'm guessing for Heiko and Marcus, your contributions to, to, to the systems themselves, how it's actually adding to your sort of uh, connection to the world around you and the services that you use. Yeah, I th I'd like to jump into Rainier's uh, experience uh, with, uh, with Databots. Databots is a, is a duo who are really deep into using machine learning uh, and manipulating uh, audio and music and all kinds of stuff with there. You can Google them, you'll find all kinds of weird stuff. It's very cool. Everyone should check them out. Uh, Rainier, could you uh, give us uh, an overview of what you've been working on and, and what that's leading up to with your debut album coming out I imminently? Sure. Yeah, sure. Um, I'd like to also add a little continuation from Harry's story of um, how this concept came about. So. I met CJ from Databot several years back online first because I had hosted this MTF music competition um, and he won. And then while I was interviewing him, he was talking about all this AI generative audio stuff he was working on. But my head wasn't quite there yet. I just, I was like on the very beginnings of trying to understand all the stuff that he was doing. And this was like five years ago, maybe six years ago. And then I met Harry at Music Tech Fest in Stockholm and learned how he was working with CJ and then everything kind of came together. So actually this album, the actual process and the method that I took of using my voice was very much inspired by Harry because he was the first artist I saw actually um, make the intangible tangible in a way that um, helped me like really make sense of how artists can use AI in an inspirational way. Um, and so I chose to feed an hour of my vocals from previous unreleased music and feed it into 
uh, uh, data bot model that uh, was the same that Harry used when he's beatboxing. And then over two and a half days, it generated 10 hours of new audio. And during this production process, um, and my head is going into so many tangents, um, also because Heiko's here. And um, just to add to the story, while I was making this album and in the midst of listening to these 10 hours of crazy, glitchy, weird AI generated audio, um, the, I met Heiko at the 808 movie night at Factory. And I had never watched that movie before. And I, I had so many goosebump moments because watching that movie just kind of like helped further support the direction that I've been seeking and wanting to go towards um, being a little bit more free. And I think for every creative, um, we're constantly looking for an element of surprise and flow and um, innovation, trying to do something different. And that film gave me that goosebump moment when I didn't know that the 88 was from like a faulty transistor and it was like a happy accident. <laughs> um, oh, you ruined the, the ending for everyone. <laughs> Just, uh, <laughs> if anyone, that's well, the end of the movie. Know, I hope that, that that will draw people to watch it even more then. Yeah, um, for sure. It was like, because going into this album creation mode, I had no idea what to expect. And, um, you know, I have so many different types of musician friends and producers and we all hit walls every now and then we hit these creative blocks and we're like how do we get i need to find my flow again i need to get inspired again um and with the ai model and the algorithm and the way that i've used it in this specific way i think the most fascinating aspect was because i've seen a lot of the ai midi generative stuff and while some of that stuff is fun and um, can be exciting to play with if you know how to manipulate those sounds and you know you have like your kind of production palette of different MIDI sample or like sorry MIDI uh, instruments and samples that you can trigger with it but when working with raw audio there's like this interesting sonic aesthetic that comes out. Um, can you describe can you describe some of the things that came out? Uh... Well it's just like because the human voice and like uh, trying to hear this like machine try to sound like you is just like really creepy and fascinating. So the first day of the data set that you listen to is like literally sounds like this weird creature trying to push its way through the machine. And some of it doesn't sound pleasant and it sounds like some alien trying to scream its way out. <laughs> and then eventually like, you get into the end of day one and it starts slowly sounding a little bit like you. And there's like this um, interesting distortion and it's like the sound of the distortion is what I became really fascinated by because I think in the beginning, the goal was, okay, can we make um, AI generative raw audio that sounds as good as the original, if not better from a production standpoint. But in the end, I actually ended up embracing this kind of like soft distortion because it wasn't like, it's not a guitar distortion. Um, it's not any kind of like digitally manufactured distortion. It was just like the natural organic output of what this um, model was creating that TV mm. created. Um, so that was really fascinating. Um, a lot of goosebump movements of like hearing the machine try to sound like me, but not quite me and sometimes blend um, vocals techniques and styles and so I would try to sing the way that it would sing and I couldn't achieve it because technically it's like doing some weird back of the throat thing. <laughs> um, so it was really interesting and I would say that for on a purely creative um, inspirational aspect um, I ended up finding just instant flows because just listening to this audio, like I'm, I was constantly surprised. There were like lyrics and melodies that I had never sung before. And instantly it was just like triggering new ideas, just like in, I don't know, a 10 minute of listening session. It was like, oh, I've got like two song ideas that just pulled out of this. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so I, I see just so much potential of this concept, this, specific model that Databots has created to only um, 
not just get better, but get more interesting and just try mm. different, um, like tweak the algorithms a bit. And I'm still trying to fully understand. And it's funny because I think um, what data bots have created, um, they have a pretty good idea too, but it, it's, it's hard to like go really, really into detail to figure out like, why did it make my voice sound like that right yeah. there? <laughs> but I'm just so curious and I end up like, um, and I end up with more questions than answers a lot of the time, but yeah. it's really exciting that these questions are happening because of this type of engagement with the technology. It certainly is. It can feel like a black box sometimes. You put something in and you wait for it to come out. But I think the, the, uh, what's been interesting uh, following both your, your and Harry, Harry's work is, is like we're slowly getting closer to a moment where where there is some sort of button we can press. I mean, a lot of people assume there is a button you press, but there isn't. It's, it's, a, it's a long, tedious process of working alongside the tech to figure out where it fits in terms of what you're, what you're aspiring towards. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's getting interesting as, as we get deeper into this area and more tools come up and more ways of manipulating data come about. I think we're getting to the point where we can create tools that are accessible to, to more people. Mm. Uh, mm. I, yeah. I wanted to get into uh, Heiko and Marcus. You guys are, sorry, Mar Heiko, did you want to say something? Yeah, I actually just wanted to comment on what Harry yeah. and um, Renya was uh, saying, because I think what, what they are doing with what they're doing is in a way they are offering a solution to a problem that's been existing for at least 40 years. Hmm. And what I mean with that is that if you look at the history of recorded music, traditionally speaking for the last, 120 years. Music first exists live and then people go into a studio to record that music, to capture that live music. And then with the beginning of purely electronic music, 40, some 40 odd years ago, this process was completely reversed. So music is being made in the studio electronic music and it only exists there. So you put it then on a recording and you put it out in the world, but that's where the music lives, so it doesn't yeah. exist live. So to come up with ideas how to creatively or authentically present this recorded music live is a challenge because yeah. it is already existing. So what do you do with this in order to perform this live? And I think AI helps because it's kind of a cross between live or it can be used as a cross between live and recorded. It's this new third way and that's something that really excites me i think yeah. it, i have to say it's so interesting because there isn't necessarily like um there isn't semantics for that middle place so when you have something when you have something that you have total ownership over you have something completely that is autonomous and this does not exist this middle space people find it very hard to to understand and one of the things I've been thinking about a lot recently is the idea of machine learning as portraiture. And in the sense of if I was to create a, a, a constantly generating version of my voice, it's the data set is in the past. This is something recorded in the past, but it's actually by being ever generating, it's also in the present. And that's not something that people kind of can grasp really. But as my voice ages, as I become old, when I die, this ever generating version of myself is an interactive frozen piece of time. And I think those principles like that are very exciting. I think it is so interesting for what you say, Heiko, is that it's hard for people to connect with that. And it's also hard to make the work or make the music or make the platform where that has like real purpose. But I do, I feel like I can call it that that is something that you will hear about more. Um, and that, that challenge itself is, is the challenge. Yeah. yeah. Um, some of this process um, reminds me of this, like a very old German crowd rock band that was started in the late 1960s, Ken, because they became known for a process that they called like the jam and edit approach. So as musicians, they were in a room together and are ju were just jamming and some songs were like 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes long. Mm -hmm. And then they were re-listening to the tapes that they were made of these gems and then they would edit them in the studios. And I've got the feeling what you can do now is um, you can not only jam together with other human beings, but you have all these different partners that you can jam and then edit with. Mm. I, I would like to also add that um, 
I feel like the interesting aspect of where we are now and the reason why more musicians should work in the space of AI, and I really hope that AI becomes a lot more easily accessible to more musicians and more musicians get interested is because so often people ask like, what do I think AI music sounds like? Or like people are so keen and so um, wanting to put like a genre aesthetic, you know, immediately to stuff. When there's something new, they're like, oh, what is this? How do we define this? Um, so the exciting thing is like, I mean, AI is just, it's a, it's a piece of technology that you can use and it can be applied to multiple genres. So, you know, it could, it'll come out differently if you uh, give it to a folk singer or a rock and roll artist um, or a, a DJ producer. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's interesting. But at the moment, it seems like people have this preconceived idea that AI music is very electronic sounding mm. and um, leans more towards like dance music. But um, yeah, I'm, I'd love to see more people use it. And just like, I think we're on the frontier of just a new path of like AI remixing. <laughs> Yeah, I think I would agree with that. I think just observing uh, your your work, I, I really feel we're at the start of something very interesting that will lead to new types of classifications for music, apart from genres, the genres that we have right now, and um, it will also create its own uh, a culture around it. I think there's the there's also another topic here that's quite interesting, is where you can move into business models around around AI music and and Beatport for example, has built its, its history as, as, a, as a music business around electronic music, providing the content to DJs and music producers to, to, to both monetize what it is they, they make and also derive inspiration and new material for, for what they're creating. Um, and I, I, I would be, I, I can't imagine a future where some of the data sets you use, your frozen in time moment, Harry, would be a, a, a sample set on one of these sites. Who knows? We could get there. And the tools created by data bots could be things that, that end up as plugins or, or whatever. But our, our imagination is limited by what we've seen in the past. I think there's, there's an open, what, what you guys are doing is really opening up the idea as to what, where this can go uh, creatively. And that in turn will influence the, the business direction of how creators monetize around this. I want to just, sorry. I just want to very quickly say is that also art is a multi-billion dollar industry. And yeah. the art itself, the artistic journey itself, the mining of the self, the work that we make, um, that in itself is a huge, huge industry. And of course, we have to think about how that applies to uh, like the, the wider scope than art itself. Hmm. But I do think there is a huge opening for people to embrace these tools um, and have that halfway point between human and process. And that in itself is already self-fulfilling as long as we continue to give it the sort of um, the critical rigor that it, that it needs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I totally agree. And uh, there's more to come. Um, on a on a more uh, linear linear approach, I, I would like to just hear from from you, Marcus and Heiko, where uh, AI plays a role in in what it is you're doing. I think I think for you, Marcus, that your 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 URL has AI in it, and maybe this is sometimes a, an issue because it, it sets high expectations in terms of what what you want. Perhaps you could talk to some of that as well in terms of the products you create, what they help companies do, and, and where you think um, uh, technologies such as AI can, can help. And, and Heiko, you can also jump in after that with, with regards to what's happening at Beatport. I mean, um, with, with having, having this AI part in the, in the URL, I mean, also we're, we're capitalizing on the hype of AI. I mean, that's mm -hmm. just as plain as that. Um, it's or as simple as that. Uh, AI does have a lot of uh, hype and it does create a lot of attention. Um, so we're utilizing that, right? But what I, I do think when talking about AI, what a lot of the times happens that uh, people are mistaking the AI as the product, which is clearly not. Like it is not the product. It is always, you have to always start with um, thinking about like what's creating the best uh, user or customer experience, what is creating the best utility. And then you walk your way back to the technology and see, okay, is there actually a better technology of solving this? Um, with the problems that we are solving right now, we believe that AI is just the best way of like, i.e. deep learning is just the best way of doing it. 
it's the fastest, it's the mo most accurate, it's the most reliable version of it. Um, but I, and I also I also think that that soon we will we will sort of like overcome this talking about uh, AI as the, the 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 thing like as the main point of focus, right? Um, I mean, prior to this uh, to this call, we talked about the word uh, cloud, right? About ten years ago, everybody was talking about the cloud. Oh, by the way, we're also in the cloud. Like now, ten years later. Um, it's of course everything is in the cloud. Like you cannot like rock up with an on-premise solution. You have to have this cloud solution, right? Um, and the same will happen with AI. It's a lot of hype right now, but in 10 years from now, five years from now, every product, every software product will feature AI in some way, mm. like without and, doubt. And do music companies uh, find it easy to understand what you're doing when you say it's AI versus when you, when you tell them how it actually works? Um, it creates a lot. Of, it creates a framework in the hats. Yeah. Um, you know, they're they're like uh, I was like, <laughs> um, there's sort of like a really big gap in the music, especially in the music industry, from people that um, believe everything AI is saying. Mm -hmm. Like you know, they just like go ahead and say, okay, AI mm -hmm. is uh, gonna solve all my problems, and then it's gonna drive mm -hmm. my kid to school, and it's gonna make me a sandwich. But mm -hmm. then there's also that, like the extreme skeptics. That's like, mm -hmm. oh no, that's not true. That's not true. I don't believe in it. Mm -hmm. um, and especially why, why this talk is extremely interesting. And I've talked to Harry and, and Rainier prior to, to this as well, um, a year back. And that especially arts is, and that's the biggest part, and I feel in this, is it's also educational. It's, it's education, educating people on, okay, what, what's the actual ability? It can soothe um, sort of like, the perceived risk of AI, um, yeah, being our doom or, or whatever, because it won't. Mm. And that's that's really interesting of making it tangible. That's what Rainier talked about, um, making it tangible, making it more, uh, yeah, like an immersive experience of what is AI, what AI is capable to do, especially in the process of co-creation. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't want to listen to AI created music. I want to listen to the new, the, yeah, the new possibilities that are created with, with, uh, with co-creation between humans. Yeah, I, I've, I've certainly found it enhanced my way of, uh, of explaining what AI is by talking through the process Harry and Rainier went through with, with sample RNN. And also more recently, we've been playing mm -hmm. around with uh, one, of the, one of the GPTs, like text, text, uh, Text AI stuff. <laughs> so I don't know what to just call it. Heiko, at Beatport, you guys have been uh, pretty aggressive in the last uh, five months, I would say, in terms of making sure that you provide a space for artists to express themselves and also for music makers to take advantage of your catalog. Could you tell us a bit more about what you guys have been up to and the intersection with AI, especially? Yeah, I mean, this has nothing much to do with, 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 with AI, but we've been doing a lot of and facilitating and organizing a lot of uh, live DJ streams and, and live streams mm -hmm. and uh, providing a space where people can connect with their audience or share their music at a moment where you don't have any parties or festivals or, mm -hmm. or live events. But when it comes to um, AI, Beatport currently is not using any of this technology. And also, I mean, in a way, we, we pride ourselves also that we have a team of, and the biggest team of human curators that sort the music and provide the music, and we don't want to get rid of this. But I think there's huge potential in using this technology. And when you just break it down to what is AI for me, or what is one of the de definitions of AI, it's... Um, discovering patterns or insights into huge data sets. And if you take music as one data set, then there's a lot of opportunities out there. So for example, if you're a DJ and if you're looking for music on Beatport at the moment, um, you can find music by searching for labels or artists. You can search for genres or you can look at tempo and pitch, but that's it. But I mean, let's say with the help of um, what Marcus and companies like his are doing, if this would be able to um, search, for example, um, you want to have a song that has a break beat in it. It's 140 BPM. Mm -hmm. It has a female voice on top and a saxophone playing the melody. You could be able to search for all these details and then find music that fits right with other that you want to play in your DJ set and these kinds of opportunities not just on a 
production basis, but also how you want to DJ and how you want to discover music. For me, that's something mm. potentially very exciting. For sure. And, and it's a much more artist centric approach in the sense that you're looking at the, the, the things that uh, music producers are trying to do and trying to address the, the challenges and opportunities there for, for their creative process. I think there's a, 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 I'm going to start wrapping up in the next few minutes, but I also wanted to build on that with some of the approaches today that we've seen and, and how they're impacting the, the music space and the arts. If we look at uh, Google's uh, team approach uh, division. It's, not, it's actually none of the above. It's a bunch of really interesting people inside of Google working on something called Google Magenta, where they're releasing uh, examples of how they can uh, use AI, in their case, machine learning, to, to both generate music and also experiment with musical ideas. And they've been working alongside artists. Some, some of the people on that team come from musical backgrounds, and they've been very... Um, open in terms of interacting with the music community, the music tech community and music tech companies and sharing what they're doing in open way and publishing their research. More recently, the, uh, there's a company called uh, OpenAI that, that uh, also has been working uh, on, on uh, music AI uh, topics and, and, and applications. And, and they created a lot of buzz recently when they released um, uh, uh, an AI, I, I hate to use this word AI, but let's just work with it for now. They created an AI that is basically trained on musicians over the last 50 years. And uh, so you could create any genre of music, any style of music, you have Prince uh, being a death metal band. You could create these kind of morphs. And uh, it's super exciting when you look at what they created, but they took a different approach to Google, which was, which was much more magenta, sorry, which was much more working alongside artists and the rights issues around their music and trying not to encroach upon, upon that deep, rooted culture and business logic. Um, OpenAI took a very radical approach and decided to just go for it and train on the da music data that, that has existed for some time. We're now in this position where we've got some amazing tech because of that, but I think there are lots of questions about uh, your training data and your, as an artist, your music is the training data for these tech platforms and where that leads us to. But um, so for some people in this case, yeah, the AI can be a foe because you're just generating music of people's work in the past. But when you look at the outputs from say, OpenAI's tech, uh, Databots created Frank Sinatra singing Britney Spears' Toxic, and that got a lot of attention, but it also was a really good example of how this can work and also opens up a broader debate around very believable synthetic media and what this means in the wrong hands. And, and technologies like this have, have the power to, to be used in very creative ways, both for uh, creative expression, but also for nefarious purposes. So, so I think um, I, I just wanted to throw that in there. We don't really have an answer for that right now, but I think we're at this point where a lot of things are possible that we, we would imagine are, are difficult to do. They're actually happening and the tech for that is being released. And, um, and I wanted to, to start wrapping up by, by asking everyone here, you know, from your perspective, everything you've heard and seen, everything you're working on, what do you think? Is, is AI, uh, in, in the, in the, as, as for the topic of this panel, is it a friend or a foe in your, in your processes? Where do you see it going? Um, just Harry, just, Harry, you're jumping in, go for it. Yeah, just, just very sure, very sure. <laughs> Basically, to sum this, to sum that whole question up, in my opinion, I think humans, human ability has limits, human vision does not. And a lot of the ways in which we try to do things uh, are limited, but our vision can surpass like by leaps and bounds. So it's not our capacity, our vision should stay intact and AI systems should be the tools that help us facilitate and make those visions manifest. So in that sense, it's a very, very, very much a friend, but it's also power. So people with power can do things that are not so good, but the systems themselves are incredible. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I would Marcus? answer. Sorry, oh, Rania, sorry. go for it. Yeah. No, no, go for it, Rania. Uh, I would say friend and foe, um, depending on how it's used. Um, oh. I think that there will be people who are going to be interested in using AI for um, unfortunate reasons and um, 
destructive ways at the same time there will be people who will use it in a much more inspiring way um and so i think that's another reason to just keep giving this technology to more artists in the hands of more creatives so that there is a bit more balance um and i it's hard it's such a hard topic in terms of um talking about like ethics of ai and um i mean my interest mainly is always going to be i think in the creative side um but the ethics side also um and it's a very very tricky area and the way i look at ai is like most technology that uses and that that's used in a way of like a self reflective way i think ai is like the most intimate technological way for any human to get a real um immediate self reflective um mirror effect um mm. same like how you know like social media when we get so immersed in it like i always say i think i'm pretty sure that most humans have a much more intimate relationship with our phones than we do with humans just simply by how many times we touch our phones in the day mm -hmm. sure. um and you know so just like social media and the way how we engage with people and then our how we reflect um on our own human behavior um uh, based on how we interact with people through technology um i think ai has that same potential to do that to all of us um and i mean i've seen so many interesting things from like people trying to create like online ai therapy bots to um people using data sets from like image data and then feeding it into a model that creates sounds from the image data and mm -hmm. so i think it's just going to get more interesting um and oh, yeah. i'm that's really that's a, that that that's kind of sure. art, that kind of art is a real really messes with your mind um yeah i agree yeah. it's uh it's uh it's definitely going to get much more interesting and and i think uh Marcus you probably have some some views on on where this tech sits as a friend or a foe be good to hear your wrap up thoughts there and then and then sure. Heiko yeah um i would actually agree with Harry and Mania like it is um it's not about oh like revisiting what i said before like it can be or it's neither like you know because ai is not the product AI is just the technology. It's just a tool. It's like a shovel. Like you can build a house with a shovel, or you can hit it on the head of somebody, over the head of somebody. Like it is always in the hands of the um, the person who applies it, right? And um, but what I do actually really appreciate, and that also shows that we as humanity have learned a big deal in the past, I would say, hundred years, is the um, conversation about it. Like never, like it's unprecedented. Never has ever. ever be a conversation about the the introduction of a new technology just as ai has like mm. if we had a thought about that clearly about how to apply it about the ethics of social media when it was applied we would not be in such a big mess right now politically mm. speaking right so i really appreciate any of these panels any of people that opening the conversation also really critical voices about it um or very optimistic voices about it um it is really like, um, yeah it's a dividing dividing topic and also again like uh, artists that are using this technology to introduce that to um or introduce use cases is, is extremely important which i mm. which i think yeah heiko final thought i don't have much to add to this but i maybe i would like to quote um an artist and she's also been experimenting with um ai um uh, lately um arca mm -hmm. and she said that for her ai is just uh, wide open horizon of uh, possibility yeah. and i think it depends where you go on that horizon um but um just the possibilities that you have and that they are so so open that's something that i'm interested in and that i'm looking forward to explore more cool 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 so to to find out more on um, harry's work and rainer's work rainer your website's portraitxomusic.com is it portraitxo.com portraitxomusic.com portraitxomusic.com harry what's your site uh, reaps100.com yeah and the instagrams you it's it's easy if you just google google yeah. them and that's 100 uh, 100 not the word 100. cool cool 
and Beatport is beatport.com. Cyanide is cyanide.ai. <laughs> so well, <laughs> wonderful. Thank you, everyone. That has been amazing. It's so great to 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 have this conversation this morning. Uh, where I'm in Berlin, Harry's in London, Heiko's in Berlin, Marcus in Berlin, and Rainier's in Berlin too. So it's a Berlin London thing. Uh, yeah, great. Thanks very much. Enjoy the afternoon. I'm gonna hit stop now. Stop. Thanks, Alan. Bye. Thank you. Everyone.